Hey guys, welcome back to our continued lectures on uh, mass balances in steady state chemical engineering. Uh, previous lectures, we kind of introduced the uh, what a mass balance was, um, as for, uh, well as the general mass balance equation, which stated that input minus consumption plus generation uh, minus output equals accumulation. Uh, we also talked about the two different types of uh, states which were steady state and unsteady or transient state as well as the different processes which uh, many reactors uh, work around which are continuous batch or semi-batch uh, processes. Uh, for everything, all the examples uh, hereafter we will assume a steady state and most of them will turn out to be uh, continuous types of processes. Some will have recycle loops, some will have uh, bypass loops, uh, but they will be continuous processes. Uh, we, I'll try to throw in some batch type of ca calculations um, in another segment, as well as the uh, unsteady state mass balances uh, after I go through energy balances uh, later on. But to start out, uh, I've already, uh, we're going to start with a pretty basic problem just so that we can start looking at the input has, or input equals output for non-reactive species. Uh, so if you're looking at a process that contains a mixture of two species called A and B, and say this process splits to have a bottom product and a top product. So this is how you would draw your flowchart. You draw a box for your process, you have an input stream, you have two output streams because it's, I said there would be a top and a bottom uh, output. So input, let's say you have 500 kilograms per hour of A. And 500 kilograms per hour of B. And then on our top stream here, our overhead stream, we know that say we have 450 kilograms per hour of A coming out, but we don't know how much B. So we denote that as M1 or M.1 for our mass flow rate uh, of B in the top overhead output stream. Now on the bottom let's say we know we don't actually know how much A is coming out but we do know that 475 kilograms per hour of B is coming out of the bottom part of this process uh, output. Well this is a pretty straightforward mass balance. We know that since it's a non-reactive process, which means that there's no reactions occurring, it means that there's no generation term and there's no consumption term. So it goes to down to input equals output. So we do two species balances. We have the first, which is A, which says that we have 500 kilograms per hour in equals 450 kilograms per hour plus M2. Well, we can solve for M2 here really easy to find that it equals 50 kilograms per hour. Now we do the same thing for our species B. We know we have 500 kilograms per hour in and that equals the fraction or the mass uh, of, of the top and the bottom, which would be our M1 plus the 475 kilograms per hour that we get out on our bottom. So when we do the same thing and solve for M1, we end up getting 25 kilograms per hour. Let me move that up here.
Now this is just a really basic case. You'll never see them usually this simple. Uh, I just wanted people to get into the mindset that if you don't have a reactive type of process, that's one that doesn't undergo any type of chemical reaction, that main, uh, the process's main, uh, main goal is to maybe agitate or separate uh, in like distillation columns and then whatnot, you're going to have an input equals output term in your mass balance. And so you're going to more than likely not even have to worry about the generation and consumption terms. Now, go ahead and take that away. Another really important concept when you get into mass balance calculations is what's called a degree of freedom analysis. And basically what a degree of freedom analysis does is it tell, uh, allows you to know beforehand, before you actually go into the calculations, whether or not the problem is actually solvable. Uh, now how does it do that? Well, the degree of freedom analysis for non-reactive species, it does change, I should note right now and tell you, it does change when you have a reactive process, but if you're dealing with just a non-reactive process, your degree of freedoms are equal to your unknowns minus the number of independent equations. So you count up the unknowns, which in the previous equation would be 2 because that was just our m1 and m2. And then you count the number of independent equations, which in the previous problem we had two, since we had two species balances. So that would give us a degree of freedom equal to zero. So if your degrees of freedom are equal to zero, what that means is that the problem is solvable and that you have enough independent equations to solve for the unknowns that you're looking to, sol uh, to find. Now, if you have a degree of freedom that comes out greater than zero, what does that tell you? Well, if you look back at the equation, it's pretty simple. You see that that means obviously that you have more unknowns than you have independent equations. So that tells you that you probably either overlooked some type of equation or, uh, or uh, relation in the problem or you have infinite solutions so either way you need to go back and look at and find uh, some of the equations that you might have missed on the other hand if your degree of freedom is less than zero it means directly or just the opposite it means you have more independent equations than you have unknowns and that can actually be I mean, what one might think oh that's no big deal but that actually can be pretty uh, detrimental to calculations because you might have redundant equations and some of those redundant equations might have errors and that would carry all, uh, all the way through your calculations and you can end up with a wrong result because of that so again if you have a degree of freedom that's less than zero it's important to go back see if maybe some of those independent equations aren't actually independent and Make, you know, validate the equations that you already have to make sure that they're correct. So this is what we're shooting for right here. Degree of freedom equal to zero. Now, one thing to note is what a independent equation actually is. Because people more, more often will get into these type of calculations, they'll write all these different equations down, and then they'll realize, well, most of the time they won't realize, that some of the equations they're writing aren't independent. An independent equation is an equation that you write that actually can't be manipulated to uh, form the second equation. For instance, if you have mass flow rate 1 plus mass flow rate 2 equals mass flow rate 3. 
Now, if I were to just write our uh, second equation that was, say, 8 times the mass flow rate 1 plus 8 mass flow rate 2 equals 8 mass flow rate 3. Well, these two equations are not independent. Why? Because if I just multiply this first equation, the whole each term by 8, I'll get the second equation. Now, no, another example might be if you have an overall mass equation, mass flow rate equation, excuse me, like we had before, mass flow rate 1 plus mass flow rate 2 equals mass flow rate 3. And then you go ahead and do a species balance, maybe species A, or it's, it, there's two species, uh, A and B, and you know the fraction, or the mass fraction of A, which is 75%, which would be 0.75M1 plus, say, 35%. So 0.35 M2 equals 0.65 M3. These two would be independent equations. There's not really a number that you're going to be able to multiply this first equation by or divide it by to get this second equation. And you can't really add this first equation to uh, anything to really get this equation um, that you have right now. So they're both independent. Now, one thing to note is if you were to go back and do the second species equation, say this was for A right here. So I'll put a little A here. And it's not going to really fit. But let's denote the, this first equation as for species A. Well, let's do species B here. I'll write that actually right there. Obviously, it's going to be 25% of mass one, mass flow rate one, and this is going to be 65 percent of mass flow rate two, and that's going to equal 35 percent of mass flow rate three. Now you couldn't actually have all three of these equations and say that they're all three independent. Now some people are going to say why? It's Obvious, you can't really multiply any of these equations by a specific number or divide them by a number to get uh, the other ones. But if you add species balance or the species balance equations, this uh, A and B together, you get the first one right here. So that means that they're obviously not independent because you can add both of these two equations together to get this first one right here. So you want to watch out for that. You want to make sure that. The equations that you end up with uh, when you're coming up with these independent equations to uh, analyze your degree of freedom and actually go through the problems, you want to make sure they're actually independent. Uh, otherwise, what will end up happening is you won't get an answer. You just won't be able to solve for it because these are technically not going to be independent equations. So you'll start going through your calculations and you'll get down to the steps and you'll get stuck and you'll waste a lot of time. Now, degree of freedom analysis is also important when it comes down to test time. If you're in, in academics, sometimes it's easier to do a quick degree of freedom analysis and find out that maybe the problem's not solvable at this given point because maybe it's uh, overspecified or underspecified and there's no need to go any further versus the other person who goes and plugs and chugs all the numbers through and gets to the point, same point, uh, answer 15 minutes later. So it's a really quick and easy way just to find out if you're going to be able to solve the problem right away or if you should maybe go on to the next problem and say that you don't have enough uh, independent equations or the problem's overspecified or underspecified. So we're closing in on 15 minutes here, so we'll go ahead and cut this video. And on the next video, we'll start out with our actual first problem. Uh, and this one will be with a distillation column. So, before we go, uh, one quick thing. Uh, that was to make sure that when you're writing these balances, uh, you want to 
write them with the fewest unknown variables. Uh, so what that means is when I usually write a problem that has an unknown mass fraction, say xA, xB, and I don't know either, instead of having two unknown variables, I'll simply denote it as xA and 1 minus xA. What that does is it relieves me of one of these unknowns and makes it easier for me to solve the problem without having to come up with another uh, independent equation for an extra unknown. And